we're going to start with the threats and attacks that cookies protect against, and then we will go into the details on how cookies work. After that, we will look at DIG to explore DNS queries and responses with cookies and show some specialities that happen when using DIG. And if time allows, which it probably won't, uh, we would look at the configuration of cookies and various options related to cookies inside the world's most widely used DNS server, the open source server, Bind. Like the other material, this all comes from the course DNS and Bind Week. This is day four or five. And um, the big difference between this and the actual courses is that there are no labs here. And actual course afterwards you would be running on your own servers, uh, configuration to set up cookies to protect your system, uh, seeing how the results of that works in a lab environment, etc. Okay, so my name is Dave Beck from Men and Mice Training. We're the partner of Sunset Learning Institute for teaching DNS and buying courses and hope to see you in one of those courses. Let's get started on the technical. So, DNS cookies are going to be a protection for four different types of threats, four different pieces of protection. The first one is the querier. Somebody who's making the query is going to be protected. That is either a stub resolver querying an RDNS server or an RDNS server querying an authoritative server. Details on upcoming slides. The next protection is for the domain name owner. So if uh, somebody is running an attack which has an effect on sunsetlearning.com, the domain name owner, sunsetlearning.com, is going to be protected. DNS cookies protect the innocent. And DNS cookies can also protect DNS servers. So it seems somebody that they can carry a lot of water. Let's see how it works. We talk about cookies being a mitigation mechanism because they don't solve all problems. What they do is still very, very impressive, but it's like anything else. Um, in the computer world in general, we talk about layers of security. And cookies is one layer of the protection of your DNS servers and your DNS systems. It is not magic. It doesn't solve all problems. We'll even talk about what it doesn't solve. So a lot of people, whoops, a lot of people won't know about the various threats that exist in DNS. So this is going to try to introduce those without spending too much time going off on those sides because we want to get to the cookies themselves. So as an introduction in that direction. So DNS protect the querier. So the querier in this picture is on the left and is sending a query to a server on the right. Again, the querier, don't care if it's an RDNS server, don't care if it is a stub sending to an RDNS server, sending a query. So what is this query being protected against? Well, he sent a query and then all of a sudden, I'm typing in the wrong window, all of a sudden there's an attacker. And this attacker sends back a bogus answer. He lies about the answer. And that bogus answer is going to injure the querier in so much as he has bad data now. This is one of the strange things about RDNS. RDNS's job is to talk to authoritative servers that it has no relationship to, except what it, what they are, what it is told by them, store it in its cache, and then represent it to other computers as if it has some idea of what it's talking about. What could possibly go wrong? Um, it, it is sort of a formula for disaster is an exaggeration, but it's not ideal. So the attacks we're talking about here are bogus answers, uh, spoofed data. There are other kinds of attacks where an IP address is spoofed. Here we're talking about spoofing the data. Now, there are two kinds of attacks like this. One is on path. On path is the attacker is literally sitting between the querier and the server and can sniff the traffic. Imagine a router along the way. Well, in that case, DNS cookies don't provide any protection. 
This is for attacks that are off path, where the attacker can't sniff the traffic. Those attacks are insanely common, and they are more difficult to execute than an on path attack but they're easier from the perspective of you don't have to be on path. You can be anywhere and run an attack. By the way, the querier is protected and it's, we're also protecting against another kind of attack called cash poisoning. Cash poisoning is we get the bogus answer and if the bogus answer from the attacker, who's probably a pretty smart person, is, has a really long time to live, maybe weeks. So all of a sudden this bogus answer is gonna live in the cash for a very long time cache has been poisoned, and the query is going to use this bad information for weeks on end. Whoops, keep typing in the wrong window. Sorry about that. So, um, protection for the domain na uh, name owner, the publisher of the domain. So let's imagine that the valid servers on the right were the servers for Sunset Learning, in Sunset, uh, Sunset Learning Institute, and let's imagine now that the attacker is sending bad information. What's going to happen? Well, the querier or the clients behind the querier are not going to be able to send email to SLI, are not going to be able to access the web of SLI, are not going to be able to do anything in SLI. SLI's traffic is going to drop. Now, depending on how popular that querier is, that could have a major effect or a minor effect, but one way or another, SLI is losing customers. And if we imagine the querier in an extreme case was Google, such as the RDNS server 8.8.8.8, .8 then it could be way over 10% of the traffic that SLI would get worldwide could disappear. Um, last statistic I read is worldwide, the 8.8.8.8 and other DNS servers, RDNS servers from Google are providing approximately 12% of the world traffic. Okay, so anyway, going back to the point, the cookies are gonna protect the domain owner. And this is the same protection if, as on the previous slide. If the attacker can't poison the cache, if the attacker can't give a bogus answer to the querier, then the querier won't accept that bad information protecting the owner as well. Now, protecting of the innocent. On the left, we have an attacker that is spoofing not data, not record data, not an A record, but spoofing in his query the IP address. In other words, he's sending out a query and using an IP address that is not his own. And the IP address that he's using is the IP address of his victim. And this attacker is gonna send many, 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 many queries to what are open RDNS servers. Open RDNS servers are RDNS servers, and there's a couple tens of millions of them in the internet, that will answer queries from any client. These are very, very badly administered RDNS servers. Will the 8.8.8.8 answer queries from any client? Yes, but it's purposely designed to be open. I would call it a public RDNS server. These were never designed to be public. So what's going to happen is the attacker is gonna send many queries to the RDNS servers. And it's gonna be even more queries than you can imagine because if the attacker is using a botnet and there's not only one attacker computer faking the source IP address, but hundreds, thousands, or even hundreds of thousands, the attack can be massive. So we're gonna show it with only one client. So here is the attacker sending a query and then the targeted victim whose IP address was spoofed is getting all of these responses. Now, what this kind of attack is depends on how it's executed. What we're showing here is the most common type of way of using it. It's called a denial of service attack because there's gonna be so much traffic going to the victim that it won't be able to handle normal traffic. Denial of service is an easy concept to understand. Imagine you are mistreated in the morning in Starbucks and they have been really rude to you and the management's been really rude to you and you wanna get back at them. You don't wanna do anything illegal, you don't wanna, you know, you wanna get back at them. Well, what happens if you do a little study and you find out the busiest time of day for Starbucks is between 7.30 and eight o'clock in the morning and on an average weekday, that Starbucks has 
let's say 100 customers in that 30 minutes. Well, what happens if you organize 1,000 people with the internet, 1,000 friends, say, look, I want you all to come to Starbucks at 7.30, 7.35 tomorrow. Don't want you to be rude. Don't want you to do anything inappropriate. Just wait in line. And when you get to the front of the line, start ordering something. Oh, I want a cappuccino with the, oh, no, wait, I don't want that. I want, and then excuse yourself and say, you know something, I've decided not to order anything and very politely leave. Well, what's going to happen is there's now instead of 100 people, there's going to be 1,100 people at Starbucks. And it's quite possible that the first person, maybe even the first two people are going to be normal customers and they're going to get service. But then the next three, four, five, six people are going to be your friends. And maybe the next valid customer is the seventh or eighth person in line. On average, they're going to be every 10th person. And those people are going to get much slower service and people further back are just going to leave because they're never going to get served. That's an example of a denial of service attack. And because many human beings in this case were involved, a thousand, we call it a DDoS attack, a distributed denial of service attack. Because this attack is showing an attack off many, many RDNS servers, it's a distributed denial of service attack. Additionally to that, we can call it a reflection attack. The attacker has spoofed the IP address so that the responses are being reflected off the RDNS servers at the victim. And then finally, you'll notice the response errors are much fatter than the query errors. That's because this is also an amplification attack. All DNS responses are larger than queries. They can be several hundred times larger. You can get a query that's down near 30 bytes and a response that's over 4,000 bytes. And that's then an amplification attack. You get a lot of bang for your buck as an attacker. Anyway, DNS cookies are also going to protect these innocent victims. And finally, DNS cookies protect DNS servers from being misused in reflection attacks. And that's both for authoritative and RDNS servers. To be clear, the attacks I mentioned on the previous page are one of several types of attacks where reflection is used. There's other ways of using that. There's other victims. That was a standard example. So why are servers protected here? Well, first of all, the server might have less of a load. It might not be a victim itself of a DNS attack. So let's imagine for a moment that the attack was sending so much traffic to the DNS servers, whether authoritative or RDNS, that they effectively slow down and maybe even experience the denial of service. And even if that's not going on, they are being misused, these RDNS servers, as part of the attack. In other words, they're part of the problem. So cookies, protect in this case as well. And what happens is cookies allow DNS servers to more quickly notice that IP address are being spoofed and either kill the amplification, they'll still respond, but they'll kill the amplification so the attack is less severe, or they'll be able to literally drop queries. So lots and lots of wonderful things that can happen here. Those are the basic protections. So here we go. DNS cookies provide protections for the querier, which is the most important part. You are not going to get bogus information. The domain name owner is protected, the innocent are protected, and DNS servers can be protected. Now, protection for the queries and domain name owners is automatic. You don't have to configure anything as long as both the client and server support cookies, this protection is there. If they don't support it, one side or the other, then cookies are ignored anyway. To protect the innocent and DNS server, you have to configure it. Of course, if you're configuring bind, it's only one line of configuration, so it's not that difficult. So, uh, I mentioned this earlier, cookies only protect for off-path attacks if the attacker can sniff the traffic, if the attacker can see the query, there is no protection at all. Okay. Um, we require support on both sides 
both the client side and the server side. If one or the other does not support cookies, they are simply ignored. There is no problem. Um, if a client queries without a cookie, then the server will simply answer without a cookie. If the client queries with a cookie and the server doesn't support it, the client will be, the query will be perfectly happy. If you know what port randomization is, something we implemented in DNS on a wide scale after a very severe attack against DNS back in 2008, it's the Dan Kaminsky attack with random first labels, if anyone's ever read about it. Um, port randomization slows down servers. Cookies, when they're widely supported, port randomization won't be required anymore. Okay, a couple little facts. Uh, cookies are 64-bit random values, ran pseudo-random meaning the input to them is uh, uh, based on something, we'll explain what. Uh, 64 bits to guess is extremely difficult. The cookies are a resource record called, or in a resource record called OPT, which means they require extended DNS. Most of us do not need to understand that right now. It's a good thing to understand in general. An OPT resource record is one that you will never publish. It is a type of record we will describe as a pseudo record in that you would never put it into a zone file like an NS record or an A record or a quad A record. However, it's used on the wire to communicate between DNS systems, client and server. Um, and servers don't store any client state. That means they can implement this more quickly. Um, DNS cookies have nothing to do with web browser cookies. And if anyone wants to read more, there is the standard document RFC 7873, which was uh, May of 2016. Okay, here we go, deep into the tech. We have a querier on the left, and he goes, all right, I'm sending a query to server X. And he, he, he may be a stub resolve, maybe RDS, doesn't matter, he's a querier. The querier looks in his cache, and he doesn't have a server cookie for that server. That's okay, that's perfectly fine. So what does the client do? The client generates a client cookie. And the input to generate that client cookie is the client's own IP address, the server's IP address, and a secret a random number that the querier has and never publishes. Okay. If you keep putting the same input in, same IP addresses, and same secret, you will always generate the same client cookie, the same client cookie. Great. There goes the query. And in the OPT resource record, we have the cookie. By the way, that's sent in the additional section for those who are a little more advanced. It's an eDNS option. Great, wonderful. What happens over on the server side? Well, I like to think of this guy as a little bit of a mafioso going, well, hey, that's a nice client cookie you get, got there, but I don't get any security from that client cookie. It does me no good, I don't care. So what does the server do? The server generates a server cookie. And that server cookie uses the following input, the client's IP, the client's cookie, and the server's secret. Keep putting in the same input, you'll keep getting out the same server cookie. Which means if this client queries again later, we should see the same exact, we should generate the same exact server cookie. Okay. So now, this server will do what the default is, and he will respond normally, meaning there's no server cookie, I don't care, I will send a normal response, whether it be an X domain or a positive answer in the answer section, he's gonna send a normal response. But in the additional section, an OPT record, he's going to send back the client's original cookie and the server cookie. This server had an option to respond with a new response code that was added just for this. It's called bad cookie. If the server had responded with bad cookie, meaning he did not send the normal answer, an X domain or no error and a positive answer, whatever. If he had sent back bad cookie, he would have still sent back the server cookie and client cookie. Okay. 
The most important thing to think about right now is the client cookie. We can actually ignore the server cookie because we're actually done with the first two protections. How? We get this normal query on its way back, normal query response on its way back, and it has the client cookie being reflected back and the server cookie. What happens on the querier? The querier looks at the client cookie that came back. If it is the same client cookie he sent, then this has not been spoofed. How do we know that? We'll go back a bunch of slides. Cookies are 64-bit random values. That is a massive, massive number of bits. Somebody off path is not going to guess a 64-bit random number. Is it theoretically possible? It's only theoretically possible. It's not going to be a threat in the real world. And in fact, the query ID, which we mentioned briefly in this morning's or the seminar, the previous uh, webinar, the earlier one, I pointed out there was a query ID, also known as the transaction ID. That's how things were protected before. That is 16 bits, 65,000 random numbers. This is 64 bits. I don't know what that number is, but it's approximately 4.3 billion times 4.3 billion. Okay. So anyway, forget server cookies. If the client cookie is the same client cookie that was sent, so if the querier gets the same client cookie back that he sent, he knows that the response is from the server. Well, well, well wait a second. What happens if something, someone sniffed something in between? Well, that would be an on-path attack, and cookies don't protect against on-path attacks. So this was, there is no off-path attack that has happened here which means we have been protected against bogus answers. We have protected against cash poisoning. And whoever the owner of this domain is, SLI, let's say, has not had his data faked. That is actually pretty impressive considering we've ignored the server cookie. We get this protection automatically as soon as both the client, querier, and server uh, support it. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Let's see what more we can do here. The querier caches the server cookie. What would the querier have done if the response was bad cookie? Well, he would have still cached the server cookie. He would have known it came from the real server because he saw his client cookie come back. And he would have requeried, so there would have been a delay, but he would have requeried sending the server cookie to the server. And then the server would have responded normally. So even if the server had been responded with bad cookie, the query would have gotten an answer. We'll get back to that. But right now, the client is going to cache, store the server's cookie. Time goes by. Yeah. Oh, important to note, server didn't store anything. The server is not keeping states for, state for the clients. Time goes by. And the querier is sending yet another query to the same server. Again, it looks in its cache, and this time it goes, whoa, I have a server cookie for that server. And the query goes out, and this time the query contains not only the client cookie, but the server cookie as well. What happens on the server? Well, there's two possibilities. The first possibility is the server cookie that arrives is valid. What does valid mean? The server is going to take the querier's IP address, the querier's cookie, and the server's own secret and generate a server cookie. The server will compare that to the server cookie that just arrived. If the two are the same, then the server cookie is valid. If it's not the same, then the cookie's invalid. We'll look at that next. So what happens if the server cookie is valid? Well, the client IP was not spoofed. It came from the same client again, which means this isn't a reflection amplification attack. Yeah, there is no denial of service going on here, which means further that this server can work more efficiently. 
it can ignore other security features it has, such as response rate limiting. What happens? The server responds normally, whether that be a positive answer, a delegation, NX domain, doesn't matter. Responds normally, and it again sends the client cookie and server cookie. Why is it important that it sends the server cookie again? Well, it's possible that the server's secret changed. And if the server's secret changed, the client needs to make use of that. If the server's secret changed, why did the server accept a, uh, a, a server cookie based on its old secret? Because when you change your server cookie or even your client cookie, you generally keep around your old one for some bit of time so that you have an overlap. Okay, so there we go. Server cookie was valid, everyone was happy. The server knows that it was not a reflection attack, an amplification attack, that there was no spoofing going on. But what happens if the server cookie is invalid? Well, don't panic right away because there's a lot of reasons the server cookie could be invalid. Yeah? The first possibility is maybe the server secret changed and it didn't know the old secret that it had previously used. That shouldn't happen, but let's imagine for a moment the server had been rebooted, its memory had been erased, whatever the problem was, and it had to generate a new server uh, cookie. Well, then in that case, there's no attack going on, just server cookie changed, uh, server secret changed. Maybe the client's cookie changed. It's possible. Again, that would mean a non-attack. And finally, as far as non-attacks, if you know what an anycast system is, anycast is where multiple unicast systems, multiple normal hosts in the internet are using the same IP address. And I understand that IP addresses are designed to be unicast, they're designed to be unique identification, much like a social security number in the United States is supposed to be unique. But there's something called anycasting where on purpose we assign multiple devices the same IP address. That's actually done quite frequently in DNS. And if that's being done, then all of, for the client, if the client is one of multiple machines with the same IP address, then all of those clients must use the same secret, which means the secret has to be manually configured. If it wasn't, someone screwed up the configuration, and that might be the reason that the server cookie that just arrived is invalid. But then here in red, there's another reason that it could be invalid. This could be a spoofing attack. If the client IP is being spoofed, that's a possibility here. Yeah? And that's what we were guarding against. So now comes the question, with that list of options, what does a server do? Well, it had the same exact options that it had if it got no cookie before. First option, it could send back bad cookie, which we said bind doesn't do by default, but now it's starting to make sense send back bad cookie. In that response, you will send the proper server cookie. If it is a real querier, meaning the IP address is not being spoofed, it will re-query sending the server cookie again, and then you can respond normally. Well, if you don't send bad cookie, the other option is the default. Simply respond normally with the cookies, yeah? So that's the default in the modern world, which means the second, the first two protections we got that we talked about the risks, protecting the, protecting the querier and protecting the domain name owner, that we got automatically from client cookies. But unless we configure the server to respond with bad cookies, when there was either a bad server cookie or no cookie at all, then we don't get the extra protection of being uh, of avoiding uh, hurting an innocent victim and of protecting ourselves as a server. Okay, so, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Let's take a look at how cookies work in DIG. 
So the command up above here, dig, and then this plus no CMD, plus no QU, plus no rec. What is that? Well, what we're saying is no command section in the output. The EDNS has seven, uh, the dig, the dig, excuse me, has seven different sections of output that you can turn on and off. And to fit on my slide, I removed some of those sections. First one is the CMD section, which uh, is up at the top of repeating back the query and uh, uh, showing what was typed. Then as uh, showing the version of dig, no question, under normal sections, the query in the response is shown. It's not shown here, so just removing unnecessary output. This query is being sent to an authoritative server directly. So to be polite to the re authoritative server, I have said plus no recurse. I've shortened it to no rec. And you can see here there is no RD flag, no recursion desired flag. Yes, we're seeing the response, but a response normally echoes back the recursion desired flag. We are sending this to an authoritative server that I know, a colleague of mine runs that server, and this is his zone, his domain, dnsworkshop.org, and we are querying the A records for that. Okay, and we're getting back an answer. And the answer is down here and everything's lovely and we're all happy. It's an authoritative answer. But look what came back technically in the additional section, but it's shown by dig as an opt pseudo section. It's really in the dig in the additional section technically. Opt pseudo section. It's in EDNS, extended DNS. And there is one big long server cookie. And the word good at the end means that it's valid. Yeah? Okay? Keep going. So even if you don't plan to work with uh, cookies, if you're running a modern version of DIG, you're going to be seeing cookies show up in every query you make. It's worth knowing what they are. So, um, this is running the exact same query twice in a row to show a very strange thing. The server cookie that's getting returned is different. 8F, 4, 54D, you know, in the, why is that? Well, it's because of a bit of a strangeness in dig. Dig is not a normal client. Why is dig not a normal client? because it doesn't save state. It doesn't have a file that it always uses for its client cookie. So every time dig runs, it generates a new client cookie. Because it's a new client cookie every time, the server cookie is gonna be different every time. Aha. Uh -huh. That's gonna get into a couple weirdnesses using dig to play with cookies. We're gonna run this again. This time we're gonna add the plus QR flag. Plus no all means don't show me any output at all. And then I say, well, you know something, you can show me the comment section and show me the outgoing query. Dig normally shows only the response. Okay, so here we see what we're sending. And in this case, we can see in the pseudo section of what we're sending of the query, we see the server cookie, excuse me, we see the client cookie. This client cookie gets sent back by the server. This is the response. Hey, wait, wait, there's only one cookie there. Aren't, isn't the response supposed to have the client cookie and the server cookie? It does. Look at the first bytes, one, seven, one, B7. The beginning of a server cookie is the client cookie. Yeah? The beginning of the server cookie is the client cookie. The problem again, we're going to run into with dig is that the next time it queries, it's going to use a different client cookie. A normal querier, stub resolver, RDNS server, is going to keep using the same client cookie over and over again. Dig's a bit weird. Okay, in a logical way. Um, where does all this stand? Well, dig is part of bind. I should make a definition 
here, I can look at the word bind, I can look at bind meaning two meanings. One is it's the most widely used DNS server in the world, running many of the root servers, um, uh, running some of the biggest DNS servers in the world, both recursive servers and authoritative servers. That server is called bind, or you could call that server name D, which is the name of the program, name of the process when it's running. And then you could use bind to have a second meaning. All of the other software that comes with that name server. And one of those pieces of software is dig. And many of the other pieces of software have to do with making your life easier with a lot of test tools, a lot of publication tools, etc. So the versions of dig increase together with the versions of bind. Since bind 9.11, dig or dig 911 dig sends cookies automatically so that's now on by default there was support earlier but it's on by default now there are new options added to dig that explicitly support cookies there are other options that have something to do with cookies for example options that have to do with the whole edns section if you tell it not to send the edns section then the cookies go away as well but we're just going to look at the moment with these three options that are, uh, that are related to and sent with dig. What's the first one? Either plus no cookie or plus cookie. Plus cookie means that dig acts as a client and sends a client cookie with every query it generates. If you want to send a query without a cookie, you could say plus no cookie. Great. Now, if you say plus cookie, the default, what happens if the authoritative server, or resolver also, but for us, let's say authoritative server, let's say the authoritative server responds to our query with bad cookie. What's gonna happen? Well, without any configuration, dig would do the same thing as any querier. It would query again, sending the server cookie. And you would never see that because dig only shows the final response. If dig queries for something and is given a C name, C name is effectively an alias telling it look up another record, it shows you the final response. If dig queries for something and is sent back a message that says, that is too much information for me to send in a message. You should re-query me using TCP instead of UDP. And that's uh, done with a special flag in the header called the TC flag, stands for truncate. So if dig makes query gets back a TC flag, what does it do? It doesn't bother showing you that. It simply re-queries with TCP and then shows you the final result. And this is the same thing. If dig sent a client cookie and got back a response, bad cookie, then it would query again, sending the server cookie, and it would show you a totally normal response and you would never see that bad cookie message. Great. And the third and final cookie option for dig is plus cookie equal, and then you can type out a specific server cookie or a specific client cookie if you want to send a specific one for testing. In fact, the slides will show that in the next few minutes. Okay, so um, this is probably a bit too detailed. I'll go over it a bit quicker just to make sure we move forward, but I, I think it's of interest. Um, so here we go, up above, I have run a dig and I have looked for the cookie coming back. And the valid cookie that this server would expect is this one, 6EE, blah, 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 blah. Great. Now we're going to run a dig, and I'm going to say, I don't want to see the output except for the comment section. This backslash is just a Unix system idea or command line option in Unix or Linux that says continue the line on the same line. Don't accept my next return. I'm just making things fit better on the screen. So continue on the same line. Dig. Plus no all, show me only the comment section, plus no bad cookie. If you get a bad cookie back, don't re-query. 
That's what I'm telling Dig. And then what I'm doing is I'm telling Dig, and this is the cookie to send. And what cookie are we sending? We're sending a different cookie than what's up here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, A, B, C, D, E, F. Boom. That is not the right cookie. We are purposely sending a bad server cookie to the same server, ns 4 tidelockde We're sending a bad cookie and we're telling Dig not to requery if it gets a response bad cookie. What happens? Will the server respond with response code bad cookie? No. Good answer, John. Well done, sir. And the, um, the reason that the answer is no is because the default configuration of a bind server is to never respond with bad cookie. Simply say, ah, here's the normal response, and I'll send you the proper server cookie to use for the next time. So server didn't respond with bad cookie. I just explained why. Yeah. Instead, the server simply sent back the proper server cookie. Okay. Now, um, so it could have responded normally, which is what it did, and it included the client cookie and the server cookie. Uh, that is the new cookie, which leads to a really interesting situation. Dig. No matter what you do with it, can never show a cookie that's not good. Because you can't, well, it could, but only if a server is supporting it as well. In other words, if you query a standard configured, standardly configured bind server that never responds with bad cookie, then you will never see a bad cookie. You're just going to see good cookie, good cookie, good cookie, good cookie, because the server will always send back some new cookie, no matter what the client sent. An interesting little strangeness related to dig always sending a different client cookie by default. Okay. Now, that, by the way, this, sorry, this little text box is just saying what I explained to you uh, before clicking so that the Dig cannot get a bad cookie response. No client querying tool can get a bad cookie response if a server is not respond, uh, configured to, set, uh, to send it. Okay. So now, let's go and actually see a bad cookie. What's happening here? Well, I set up a server that is designed to respond with bad cookie. Dig, throw away most of the response. Show me only the comment section. Comment section is very poorly named would be a lot better if it was called header. Yeah, DNS message effectively has five sections, a header section, and then uh, a question section, an answer section, authority section, and an additional section. And I'm saying, I don't wanna see any of that stuff, I only wanna see the comment section. And by the way, Dig, if the server sends back bad cookie, don't re-query, show it to me. So we send that to a server, the server is 192, 168, 53, 252, and we query for some domain name. And what the server sent back was status, response code, bad cookie. Bad cookie. Aha, uh -huh. bad cookie. But what did the server also send back? It sent back a new cookie that this client, Dig, should use to re-query to get a response. If we had not added plus no bad cookie, what would we have seen? We would have seen status and a normal status, probably no error, because dig would have queried again automatically with this response. It wouldn't have shown us this bad cookie response at all and would have only jumped to the final response. Okay. Um, ah. Okay, so that's dig. The, the big thing is it uses a different client cookie for every query, adds a bit of uniqueness, and then we had those three options. Okay, what's next? Well, the last thing we can play, play with is to take a look at cookies inside named it. If a query has a valid server cookie, then named is gonna, not apply what's called response rate limiting. What's response rate limiting? Response rate limiting is, whoa, 
look at all these queries, these identical queries coming from the same IP address or same range of IP addresses, this may be a spoofing attack. This may be a fake IP address. And if I answer all of these queries, I'm going to be making the internet a worse place. And not to mention, I have a lot of work to do. So what response rate limiting does is it tries to identify spoofing attacks. When so many identical queries continually reply, it doesn't have to be identical. There's a second option, but the default option, identical queries continue to come in. It recognizes the problem. And then it doesn't want to be cruel and not answer any queries because, you know, maybe some of those are actually valid. You know, maybe the spoofed client is actually sending some of those clients. It's just, you know, he's an innocent victim as well. So response rate limiting is just hitting the brakes, slowing down the responses. How can we do that? Well, one way is we can drop every 10th query, every fifth query, every second query. And in fact, that's the default when you configure this, it's totally configurable in mind, that you drop every second query. Yeah, don't respond to it at all. And the other way to fight against that attack is to respond, but respond with the TC flag that I mentioned earlier. The TC flag, the flag that says, you should query me again, but use TCP. How does that help the problem? Well, amplification is you sent me a UDP query, 30, 40 bytes, and I sent you a big fat 3,000, 4,000 byte answer. Or even if it's just a hundred, couple hundred bytes, you got amplification out of that. But if I send back TCP flag in my UDP response, hey, query again. Well. A spoofed client that gets that is going to go, well, I didn't make the query in the first place, so it doesn't query again at all. That response is very small because it doesn't have the amplification. And a real client won't suffer much because a real client will query again with TCP. So TC is actually a better way to handle response rate limiting. And what Bind does by default is it does a mix. It drops one and it TCs one. It drops one and it truncates one. Okay. Now, Inside of NameD, there are six configuration options that have to do with cookies. Only one or two are directly really fascinatingly important. We'll look at that all six quickly. So if you know NameD is configured typically from a file called NameD.conf, there is a global option called options and everything in options um, is a uh, configuration for the whole server. And there are six configuration options related to cookies, directly related to cookies. So the first one, require server cookie. And that's a Boolean. A Boolean means you can say true, yes, or one, and then we'll turn it on. The default is no, which is the same as off or false. And this is, what will make the server respond with bad cookie? The default is no, so under normal circumstances, it will never, ever, ever respond with bad cookie. Yeah, so this is the big option. You want to turn it on, global options, require dash server dash cookie, yes. The next option, cookie algorithm. What algorithm should it use to generate its secret? And unless you're a cryptographer, leaving the default of AES is absolutely fine. Yeah, other options are SHA-1 and SHA-256. Cookie secret, where you literally give it the secret so you don't let it generate its own secret. Talked about any cast situations before. In any cast situation, you have to do that because all of the machines in the any cast, all of the machines sharing the same IP address must query with the same IP, uh, with the same secret. And if it doesn't, you're going to have a configuration problem. Okay, so certainly a more advanced feature, only majorly of interest if you use any casting. Last options, no cookie UDP size. This option is, for me, a futuristic option. And it's an option against what would be a downgrade attack. What's a downgrade attack? Well, in this case, what it would be, Let's imagine a world 
where cookies are very widely implemented. That might take 10 years to get to, but over time, things get implemented. And cookies are being implemented relatively quickly, so we're seeing them more and more. So at some future date, the mass majority of clients and servers support cookies. So what's a downgrade attack? Well, let's imagine I am running a DOS attack and I'm spoofing the IP address of another system. Well, if I send it without any cookie and there are no cookies, then cookies are ignored. They provide no protection. So I can get around the protections that cookies provide as an attacker just by sending no cookie. I didn't send a cookie. Sorry, I don't support it. Well, right at the moment, you'll probably get away with that. But as the world gets to have more and more and more clients that support cookies and say the mass majority that, that do, then what the administrator of this server can do is he can say, okay, that's fine. If you have no cookie, I will limit my response size to be very small. The default here is 4,096 bytes. That is not a random value. That is the absolute largest response that a server can ever send with DNS, and only if extended DNS is used, eDNS. Without eDNS, that limit is actually 512 bytes. But look at this. We can set it down all the way down to 128 bytes. So if there's some huge future where everyone uses cookies, and now we got a query without a cookie, we could say, well, great, query me again with TCP. My lowest maximum is 128 bytes or something a little bit higher. Sorry, your response goes over that. TC flag. And if it was an attack, we just thwarted it. Now, the last option here, send cookie, where you can literally turn it off on the RDNS side. The other options are more for authoritative servers. Bind is both authoritative and client. This is saying, you know something? I don't want to send client cookies. And by default, you want it to send client cookies. So the default is yes. Why would you turn it off? Well, let's imagine for the moment you are querying frequently an authoritative server that not only doesn't properly support server cookies, it is so badly designed or configured that it breaks when there are cookies. Now, that should never, ever, ever happen. Cookies are designed to be ignored. That is in the original standard of eDNS, even before cookies were written. Options that are not understood are ignored, which means if sending a cookie breaks a zone that you are querying, that zone itself is broken. Well, that's great, except you know, oh, so they're not, they're violating the standards, wonderful, but that doesn't do you much good if your company needs to send a lot of things to that other company, if it needs to query that domain a lot. Let's imagine for the moment the um, broken domain was, I'll use an example from Switzerland, CHCH. CHCH is the federal government of Switzerland. Happily, their things are not broken, but let's say it was. And your company, you're, you're sending in taxes, you're doing whatever things you need to do with the Swiss government, and CHCH is broken. Well, they're wrong, but you have a problem. Yeah, Your clients can't do their job. So because of that, you could turn off sending cookies. Do not do this in the global options block. Instead, what you should do is set up a statement called a server statement where you give the IP address of a server and you tell it for that one or four or six broken servers for CHCH to not send cookies. If you were lost, I understand we jumped into an advanced topic. I tried to give the background of the type of problems, but people don't know exactly what eDNS is all the details of queries. So it's a more advanced topic that, you know, jumping in the middle of is difficult. But we're trying to, again, want to help you here. We want people to benefit from this itself. And we're also trying to generate interest in the courses we mentioned this morning um, and, and hope that uh, people want to attend those courses. So that's why we chose the advanced topic. I hope it was of interest. 
How do you thwart a bad cookie? Okay. Okay. So the server will both though. Good. Okay. So the server is going to bind by default. And so the answer to that from a bind server, and every server will be configured differently, you require the server cookie. You turn on this option. So in other words, if the server then gets anything with this option, require server cookie, yes. If the server then gets anything other than its own valid server cookie, meaning it doesn't get any cookie, but let me correct that. It only gets a client cookie or it gets an inappropriate server cookie, not its own, then it will respond with bad cookie. It'll send back the proper server cookie. So that's how a server protects itself. The client is protecting itself by guaranteeing that it only sees its own client cookie. So that's way at the beginning and So this was looking at a bogus answer. How did we protect against that? Well, this bogus answer, this original query had the client cookie in it. A proper answer reflects back, sends back that client cookie. An off-path attacker will never know that 64-bit client cookie. Uh, server cookie, excuse me. So because of that, the attacker won't be able to send bogus answers. The querier is going to say, nope, you don't send me back my client cookie. I ignore it. I am going to know that you are spoofing your answer. Kim Breck <laughs> wrote to everyone that um, she or he was looking at the name D config file on an F5. So the F5 load balancers, <sighs> What you'll find in the DNS world is that load balancers or NAT servers or firewalls can actually make security worse because often they don't support certain features. And this may be an example of that. I haven't looked at cookies on the F5, so um, I'm guessing they're not yet supported. Or if they are, maybe you need a newer version. If you go to the Sunset Learning website, instructor-led training, if you look at courses by technology and you go down to DNS and bind, you will see three courses. The most popular is the five-day DNS and bind week. The first three days of that is DNS and bind fundamentals. If you click on it, you'll get a description of the courses with details. Um, the Next course is not yet officially planned, but keep your eyes open. It is likely to be December 16th uh, at SLI in Denver. Now our courses are only live. You'll actually have to be in Denver to take the course. We don't yet do remote classes, but our classes are very popular. We had one last week at SLI in, um, uh, near, near in Reston, Virginia, near Washington, D.C. And one participant flew in from Germany. Another participant flew in from India. That is completely normal uh, for uh, our courses. Um, back to uh, John, a uh, good question. What relationship do DNS cookies have to DNSSEC, if any? Directly none. The so DNSSEC is one of many systems to protect DNS because it has the name DNSSEC, DNS security. People often look at it as being the only security mechanism there is. Um, I will say now, I mean, they, they're, they're in, in two different worlds. So let's briefly, we already discussed what DNS cookies do. What does DNSSEC do? DNSSEC is a validation mechanism to know that the response you got is a valid response. So there are lots of things where you need to know that what you're doing is the real thing. So for example, you go to a website you go to the website uh, American.com, which I think is where American Airline is, American.com. And you're planning to give them your credit card information at the end of this. 
how do you know that's the real website? Well, the browser has a little lock symbol here up in the, up in the corner, which uh, by the way is pretty questionable how trustworthy it is. It means that what that lock symbol means is between you and the server that sent you this web page, the information was encrypted. So there was nobody in the middle, no man in the middle attack changing it. However, what you don't really know is if it truly came from America. That is supposed to be proven by certificates. Unfortunately, certificates are pretty much a failed system in the web browser world. Okay, what's the equivalent of that? Well, if I do a query for American.com and I'm given a fake IP address, or I'm trying to send an email to my friend at gmail.com and I get a fake MX record and then a fake IP address, I send email to someone else, that's a huge problem. And DNSSEC allows a receiver of information to validate, to absolutely guarantee and prove the data hasn't changed. So that's two different directions. Yeah, from DNS cookies and DNSSEC. John, is that good? Excellent. Um, oh, 16 people stayed around from 18, not bad. Any other questions? Not seeing anybody, I will say goodbye. Say I hope to see you in December. If anybody has any questions about the training or anything else related to DNS that you'd like to hear more of, um, I think you can send that through to SLI. They will get it to us and get it to me. Um, and we'd be very happy to hear from you. My email is david.beck at meninmice.com, but probably your best bet for finding out at courses is to speak to your sales representative at SLI.